So a little bit of background um, on Weyburn. You can, uh, this is really just uh, an overview, but what's important here is, is the amount of information. And you can see that in our study area, we had 30,000 wells. Um, all that information is public. It's regulated by our state or province that um, every well that's drilled has to provide all the core, all the logs, and it's all publicly available. So you can, we can access that as we please. But it's, it's almost a blessing in disguise because when you have that amount of data, and you're trying to work with that that volume of data it, it can complicate things more than and more than you know the advantage that it might give you um, in trying to uh, do a characterization but nevertheless uh, we incorporated about a thousand of those wells and built a geological model for Weyburn so it's quite comprehensive and um, I'll, I'll, I'll you'll, you'll notice that one of our projects um, going forward is, is looking out how, how to how to how to use that data moving forward so one of the techniques which I think is fairly common knowledge now um, is the use of geophysics or, or 4d 3d seismic to to see co2 um, and I think there's kind of two perspectives that you can look at this and depending on really um, the the, I guess the who, who you're presenting to, um, you can come at it from a couple different perspectives. So if I'm presenting to regulators, I say, well, this is a really un you know, a unique tool um, that helps us see where CO2 is. Um, that's about the level of degree that, that we can, can say that, yeah, we can, we can tell where it is. Um, if we're presenting to a group of operators, basically we say, 3D seismic allows you to figure out where you want to do your infill drilling. Um, so there's kind of dual purposes for this depending on uh, who you're presenting to. Um, but I will note one thing here that hasn't really been mentioned over the last few days is, is that while seismic is good at trying to give you an image of where the CO2 is, it's still not yet capable of quantifying the amount of CO2 that's there so moving forward um, in order to meet you know whether it's permits or or kind of uh, regulations for co2 storage that's still one challenge that we're unable to necessarily identify that a certain blob of co2 is x amount of tons of co2 so um, other than doing a mass balance of knowing what's gone in and what's come out we still don't necessarily know um, can't, uh, we aren't able to verify or validate the amount of CO2 that's in that reservoir. Passive seismic monitoring. Um, this is starting to become a, a, a little bit more popular area of discussion, at least in, in North America, about um, really by through CO2 injection, whether or not you're inducing earthquakes or creating earthquakes. Um, and so in, in the Weyburn project, we had uh, a downhole geophone string in, in one of the observation wells. And uh, we were able to interpret that, that information. And, and basically the result is, is that any of the activity that was seen um, was less than a magnitude one. Um, so it's really not that relevant. Um, but the challenge that we had with only having one geophone string in one well, we aren't really able to locate where those events are happening. And so without another point of reference, um, we, could, we could identify that there were events that were happening, but we didn't know necessarily if they were associated with the injection or production or just potentially other events that are happening um, in the area. I don't know. Um, if anyone is or how many people are familiar with the alleged leak um, that was reported at Weyburn but um, in, in hindsight it couldn't have happened to a better project um, to be quite honest so the the, the background uh, to this story was that there is a, a farmer in the area that had decided that he would get an independent contractor to come out and test for soil gas and the independent contractor found out that yes there was CO2 that was coming up that, that he was able to sample. 
Um, and they ended up uh, the, jointly between the two of them hooking up with an NGO and basically held a press conference that CO2 is escaping from the, from the Weyburn Reservoir and even one of the bylines from, from one of the papers said that the well was spewing dead animals. So that's how much out of context that it was taken. And so we had a very quick lesson on uh, crisis communications for related to a CCS project. And um, evidently, once we were able to look at it, we definitively proved that it was not the case. So um, what the consultant didn't recognize was that obviously there's biogenic CO2 that's always being vented to the to the atmosphere, and one of one of the studies that we did, um, we we had to do many obviously to to verify and validate um, our position. But this one, this slide, uh, or I guess this uh, research that we did in particular, basically along the bottom, it shows the characteristics of what the CO2 is being injected, I guess, the, the, it, at a number of places. It's, it's the anthropogenic CO2 that, that's being injected at Weyburn. There's even a couple of different sources here, um, Rangeley and Teapot Dome, um, of, of what the characteristic is of that CO2. The study then went and looked, can't quite hit here, but at the top there it is actually um, the carbon that was sampled from our control sites and from the sites that were had proposed CO2 leakage and so you can clearly see that um, they are not from the same source of CO2 that they are entirely different and that was just one of the ways there's there's multiple ways that we kind of duplicated this the same uh, same result but it was definitely proved that it is not the CO2 from the reservoir so as I think uh, Stuart mentioned that, you know, well bores always seem to be raised as the highest risk of leakage. And so one of, one of the studies that we did in Weyburn was we actually developed a tool that was able to go downhole, drill through the casing and the cement and pull that core back up for testing. So we did a number, number of those tests and, um, and at, at the, end, the end result, um, I guess that the location of, of the sample was somewhat important is that there was a, a field nearby um, that has a natural source of CO2 in it, about 75% CO2. And the well that we had drilled through had seen CO2 for about 50 years. So um, it was a well that had, you know, had seen CO2 for quite some time. And the end result from really all the samples uh, that we took was that the casing and the cement was in good condition. So I guess maybe somewhat of a surprise to, to some people, but um, I guess I have to kind of caveat that a little bit is that you're talking about a very small core compared to the entire length of a well bore. But I guess at this point, what we've demonstrated, at least for the samples that we've taken, that um, you know maybe well well casing and, and cement, um, if done properly, might not be as big as concern as as what people might lead you to believe. So SAS CO2 user, this is the the, the follow-on stage to Weyburn, and um, it, it's really taking the lessons learned and 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 the recommendations for further work. Uh, from that project and, and applying it um, to a new program. And really the, the aim and the objective of this new set of projects is to really support industry. So um, we have uh, Synovus, the, the operator of the field, engaged and in, in basically helping direct us to what might be some operational issues that they may or maybe are forecasting that they may have. Um, looking towards uh, uh, CO2 storage. So this is kind of how I said you kind of have to read between the lines from, from what we've done to date and why we've chosen these projects. So the first one is evaluating minimum data sets. So obviously not everyone has the ability to build a geological model with 1,000 or 30,000 wells. Um, and so in order to be really applicable to anyone, we need to be able to reduce that data set 
and see if we can come up with the same answer um, with a reduced data set. So since we have the opportunity to do that, that's what we're going to be evaluating on that. Overburden monitoring. This is basically a, a study on trying to determine monitoring techniques of if there is CO2 that is above or below your intended reservoir, how do you monitor that and how would you report that to the regulator? So um, this is looking at kind of downhole techniques or a combination of uh, you know, geophysical techniques on how one might start to evaluate that. Um, you know, the operator, uh, Synovus, is obviously really, really experienced of what's happening in their reservoir. But typically, that's the only part of the, of the geological column that they're interested in. Um, so if there are any kind of uh, uh, migration above or below the reservoir, um, they're looking for some support on, on how they would evaluate that. Passive seismic monitoring, this is basically just uh, improving our, our, our array. Um, so we're going to be putting out uh, new, new equipment so that we're able to locate um, these passive seismic events and be able to distinguish um, where they're coming from or what might be causing them. So we're also in an area um, that there are multiple formations being drilled and, and, and produced and explored. Um, one of those being the Bakken formation that uses fracking. Um, so there are kind of competing, um, I guess, opportunities or I guess competing uh, resources out there that may be producing um, these induced seismic events. The, the third one is that we also have potash mines in the area that are disposing of uh, brine water and it's actually publicly known that they've uh, have induced three to six magnitude earthquakes um, near the mines themselves. So um, we're, we're trying to distinguish and, and, and definitively prove that, that injecting CO2 um, is not a cause for, for creating earthquakes. The, the last two to three um, are really looking at trying to provide operators with a, with a well bore, with a well design, so um, from the design to completion to abandonment. Um, there still, we felt that there was still extra work that was needed on casing corrosion. So while we didn't find any in the well that we looked at, um, certainly we have uh, wells that go back uh, to the 1950s that there's very little information on in the Weyburn field. Um, some of them we might not even know that, that they're there that might exist, um, to be quite honest. So there's still some, some work that we want to do on that to try and predict uh, what that corrosion rate might be and uh, if, there, if there's a rate leakage or a leakage rate associated with that. And the, and the last one um, is one of our smaller projects, but could be potentially interesting is that um, over, I guess, the last two years, um, three to four wells have been drilled um, in infill wells that have been drilled um, in the area of the CO2 EOR flood, which ha have already been flooded. So it was flooded. Um, these wells were, were drilled, which had seen CO2 for about 10 years. So we have access to those cores, and we're going to be kind of analyzing the, the rock structure to see if what impacts it's had on the rock, if any, um, if there's any mineralization or anything like that uh, associated with the CO2. Aquastore, um, this is our deep saline storage project. This is associated, this is, is really associated with a full CC US um, chain project. So um, Aquastore itself is going to be used as a buffer system. Um, I think it might have been previously mentioned, but SAS Power uh, has built a post-combustion um, CO2 capture unit on their, on their coal fire power plant. And um, in association with that, we are, we are um, going to be demonstrating a deep saline aquifer storage project. In addition, the majority of the CO2 is actually going to be sold to Synovus for injection in Weyburn as well. So, um, so Synovus has a, has a strong hold on, on essentially all the CO2 that's available in the area, and they're just going to continue to expand their field. 
So AquaStore itself, um, just going to kind of go into the range of monitoring that we've done. So there are different aspects that one can look at it as is technologies that look at the plume monitoring, technologies that are really used for public assurance, and then from an operational perspective, the injection, or injection and, and containment um, uh, for a project. So uh, to date, we've drilled two wells. This is just a, a diagram illustration of the observation well that we drilled. So they're quite deep wells. They're 3.4 kilometers deep. Um, and they are fairly fully um, implemented with uh, monitoring technologies on it. This, this well, observation well in particular, it has pressure and temperature gauges in the reservoir and in, in the cap rock. We have fiber optic lines that are also casing conveyed for uh, temperature and acoustic. And um, then kind of into, you know, into the detail, there's CO2 resistant cement for a portion on the bottom. Um, the injection well, not shown here, has chrome casing across the packer for um, trying to alleviate any concerns about CO2 um, corrosion. And um, at the bottom here, I guess somewhere in this area, is a fluid sampling port um, that we can retrieve reservoir samples downhole. So the two wells are about 180 meters apart, so it's not very far, that far apart. Um, so we're hoping to see um, the plume migrate from the injection well to the observation well in order to validate the, the simulations and the information. So our, our monitoring uh, installations, just to give you a sense, um, this is the Boundary Dam power plant right here. These are their ash lagoons. We're about two kilometers to the west uh, of them with the, with the two wells. That was our, our area of study. It's about 30 cl square kilometers. Um, within that 30 square kilometer area, we have installed a permanent array of 630 geophones that are buried to a depth of about 20 meters. So um, essentially, we can go out and um, if we have a, a source of, of either dynamite or vibro size, we hook up the permanent array and um, can effectively take a, a, a seismic survey relatively cheap. Um, so the, definitely the cost has been reduced by an order of magnitude um, in, in repeat surveys. Um, so you can kind of see here, geophones in the ground, that's what, that's what they look like. On the surface, there's a data collector and a battery um, at them. So we've upgraded these in the past year or so. So kind of uh, replacement of them is about every eight weeks. So we have someone go out every eight weeks and recharge the batteries and download the data. In addition to that, we have these triangles. So there are about 50 stations for monitoring uh, soil gas. So these are also uh, kind of semi-permanently installed. We, these, these triangles are what we call our super sites uh, for monitoring. So it's kind of an integration of a, a number of equipment. So um, we're taking surface gravity. We have INSAR reflectors. We have tilt meter. We have GPS. Um, we have a network of about 20 um, drilled groundwater wells and they're all basically located together um, using some using and, and mostly using uh, solar power solar power to operate them so that the, the information can be sent by cellular back to across Canada whoever whoever's uh, analyzing the data and so it's it's quite comprehensive across the area and that's just our 3d uh, sources. So one of the, and, and this is my last slide, one of the, I think, the unique um, advancements that we might be upon and that's providing some pretty um, intriguing results is the use of a STAS fiber line. And so really um, when we were cons when we were designing our observation well, we would have liked to have a casing conveyed geophone string on the outside of the, of the well casing. But costs were prohibitive once the size of the geophone increased your, your well bore size and basically it was going to cost more to drill the hole that much larger than it would be I guess the value of collecting the information from the geophone string. So uh, in lieu of that uh, we installed a DAS fiber which is a digital acoustic fiber. And 
we've done a number of surveys, but I'll just focus in on, on a couple. Um, this is our last survey in the fall, um, and then we had one in the spring of 2013. And so the first, first survey that we did was just trying to acquire any kind of information using the DAS fiber. Um, and the second one in the fall, we, we did a little bit more advanced work. But the result, and I'm not a geophysicist, but we were able to interpret um, through the DAS, get a seismic interpretation. And so this, this figure here itself is actually from the first survey that we did. Um, and so we used, uh, in the second survey, we used a 60 level geophone string and compared it to the DAS fiber. And uh, the results are still, still in the works and probably will be, um, some of the information will begin to be published uh, later this fall. But the results are promising. Um, it, the DAS fiber isn't quite as closely accurate, I guess, as a geophone string, but it's close enough to be considered as an alter, alternate. Um, so there's a couple of key, key things there that are interesting. One is that um, you can obviously use a fiber um, as a geophone string. Secondly is in our second deployment, we also were able to record in multi-mode. And the importance of that is that for existing DTS strings, so that's digital temperature fiber optic strings, um, that they use multi-mode to record in. So potentially um, anyone that has a DTS fiber line on their well may also have a geophone string on their well. Um, and so this would be, I think, quite a breakthrough and probably prevent a lot of uh, extra cost in bringing out a, a wireline truck and, and having that expense out there. So we're, we're moving forward with this. Um, one of the big partners is, um, is Chevron that's um, um, helping invest in our R&D in our and in this R&D in particular moving forward. And we're, we're just on the cusp of considering a JIP um, to see if there's additional interest out there from, from other operators. And, and certainly, I think one of the advantages is that um, we can make the, the information available. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the data, data will be available for, for your own interpretation. So um, it's kind of one of the things that's quite interesting. Um, I, I will just note that one of the other leaders in this is Shell. Um, Shell houses installed on their Quest wells as well. Um, and so they've been doing this probably for at least three years now. And while their information isn't necessarily public available. I think they're they're getting similar results and and considering uh, including it in their commercial development plan. And that's it. Okay, thank you, Kyle. Um, any questions for Kyle on this?